talk about a lot of different things on this YouTube channel, but notably absent are transit fantasy maps. I don't propose 22 line subway systems for Calgary or Vancouver or multi hundred kilometer expansions of the Toronto streetcar network, not to mention any other cities around the world. And people do often ask about this. In today's video, I'm going to talk about some of the issues with fantasy maps and why I don't spend much time on them. Let's talk about it. If you aren't already, make sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram for all of the latest on the channel, as well as to potentially help contribute to future videos around the world. If you're not a fairly large transit nerd, you may not know what a transit fantasy map even is. And so let me explain. Fantasy maps are what they sound, and transit fantasy maps exist for people to imagine what their city might maybe possibly look like someday. Now there are tons of different transit fantasy maps. Some simply change the design language or the particular routes that are featured on a city's transit map, while others propose new extensions and perhaps even new lines. And further, some maps propose a blank slate redesign of a city's entire transportation network. And here's where we get into why I don't like transit fantasy maps for me. The underlying issue for me is that it's less interesting to talk about stuff that just isn't real. And I think in many cases, fantasy maps can actually be an actively negative thing because they take people's attention away from real advocacy issues and technical issues with transit systems and focus them on an unrealistic future vision of what a transit system might look like. This often means a lot of potential advocates become disconnected from the real issues today on transit systems, whether they be service levels or funding or public spaces. Now, fantasy maps actually get even more problematic, and a lot of these issues have crossover with some of the big issues we face in transit building. For example, sometimes when people design fantasy maps, they don't necessarily decide where to put lines based on actual demand. What this means is you might see subway lines going all over the place, but they're rarely serving the corridors that are actually the most in demand in the city. Another major issue with transit fantasy maps, particularly ones that are designed basically without even looking at an actual map of the city, is that they can be designed without a practical lens to them. I think a really important thing to consider when designing new transit lines is where there are appropriate corridors to build them. Of course, we should be targeting corridors where there is a lot of demand, but at the same time, we should be seeing how we can serve these corridors in convenient ways. If you have to build an east-west subway line in your city, and you could do it in a few places, it makes more sense to build it on the wide street where you can do cut and cover perhaps, rather than deep underground under a residential district. The problem is that there is some crossover between fantasy maps or people's imagination of what projects should look like and what actually gets built. For example, in Toronto, the Scarborough subway extension is a project that exists. So we're building a subway extension deep underground, even when a perfectly suitable corridor that's on the surface and would be much more affordable to construct in exists. At the same time, massive plans can obviously be really cool, but at the same time, they're kind of saddening too, because you can design a massive transit map, but in all likelihood, you'll never see it actually realized, which I think is kind of discouraging. It can be fun for sure, but for me, the satisfaction is in imagining something that could really come to fruition. Perhaps the most important thing is I don't really think it makes sense to do transit planning that far in advance, especially in peripheral areas of a city. Sure, we know that the downtown core of Toronto, for example, or Paris is probably going to need more rail capacity at some point. But planning lines way out into the suburbs and lower density areas 50 years in advance just seems a bit foolish. It's good to preserve corridors and to be ready to build transit, but you have to remember that cities change a lot. Sometimes cities don't grow as fast as you expected. Sometimes they grow much faster than expected. And sometimes districts and cities that used to be important become less important. You can see this kind of reflected in major older systems like the New York City subway. There is a ton of capacity in New York that goes mostly unused because it doesn't serve the demand of today. And you want to avoid building a system like that. Now, to be perfectly clear, I'm not opposed to people making these fantasy maps. I think they can be a tool for good too. The most obvious way they do this is by getting people excited. It's amazing if you're interested in transit, but a lot of people can't imagine what their city would look like with way more transit and way more accessibility. And so transit fantasy maps can show people if we build line here and here, we could have a really good network. At the same time, they can spur discussions and create a sort of cross-pollination for ideas, especially when people take the time to actually plan around reasonable corridors. Perhaps someone makes a map and they suggest using a certain corridor because it would be really useful and cost-effective. And then someone else jumps off that and says, oh, maybe we could tie it into another corridor and create a better transit line overall. 
I think one of the most important uses of transit fantasy maps is to just translate the projects actually happening into a map that people understand. One of the biggest failings I see in many proposed transit projects or even transit expansions is that they don't show what the final network will actually look like. You have a design for a map that is the existing subway system, and then you have an expansion map which shows where new lines go, but there's no map that shows the existing system and what it would look like if you added on those under construction projects. I think a map like that is super valuable because it can really connect people who are familiar with an existing transit network with just what's being built. Now, of course, I have done a few transit fantasy maps, so I want to specify when I use them myself. The first thing I always consider is, is there a compelling case here that a map will help me illustrate something that I couldn't illustrate by just explaining it? I also do really think that last point from before about illustrating progress and current projects is really important. In Toronto, for example, we're building a ton of different subway expansions, but most people don't really register that that's actually happening because our current transit map doesn't look anything like what it will in the future. At the same time, it can help build demand for projects that are obvious or that clearly should happen next. For example, in Toronto, if you look at the transit map as it will look in about five to 10 years with the Finch West LRT and the Eglinton West LRT on the map, you'll see how small the gap between those two lines is. And that's a great way of helping to build support to actually connect those lines. So yeah, while I like fantasy maps as much as the next person, I think they can sometimes be a little destructive. I like to keep transit plans close to my chest and just look at the next wave of projects or perhaps what comes after that. That said, sometimes I do like indulging myself in a good fantasy map. Thanks for watching.